the theme of this year's renewal is that the, the attributes of God and the work of God is revealed to us in the gospel. An attribute is some aspect, some part of God's character or nature. So what we're saying is, is that God has revealed himself to us. Now that alone is a pretty staggering consideration. Now my part to play in this series of sermons all wrapped around that theme, I'm going to be talking tonight about the covenant that God promised to make. And my text is in Hebrews chapter 8. If you'd like to turn there with me in your Bibles, I'm going to read the passage, Hebrews 8, and I'll start reading in verse 8. There is also, by the way, a quotation here of another text. Uh, Another text is quoted in this passage from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to about verse 34, I believe. But we're just going to read from Hebrews. Hebrews 8, verse 8. For he, that is God, finds fault with them, that is the people of Israel... When he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The very first revelation of who God is, involved something that God made. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, you can know a lot about a person by what they do, by their works. And we can know a lot about God by what He has done and the things that He has made. After He created the heavens and the earth and And all the fullness thereof, as the Bible puts it. It says, God said, and this is like a conversation within the Trinity. God said, let us make man in our image. Now, why did God do these things? Why did God make all of these things? Why did God make us? Was God just bored? Did he have nothing else to do? Uh, Was God lonely? Needed some company? Well, no, of course not. God God had a multitude of angels. And we know that God could never be lonely anyway because the Godhead has always been in loving fellowship. Now, I can't point to a, a single verse that says it this way in the Bible, but I think the whole teaching of Scripture seems to indicate that God wanted to create because He wanted to share Himself. He wanted to reveal himself to other personalities, not just, not simply servants, although we are servants of God. He had angels to serve him. But he wanted to reveal himself and share himself with other personalities who could enter in to the same loving fellowship that the Godhead had enjoyed from all eternity. At the center of all reality is this loving, harmonious relationship and fellowship, maybe is a better word for it, between the Father and the Son and the Spirit 
And we are being invited and drawn into that divine fellowship. You have been made for nothing less than that. You've been made for God. To seek and to know God. Now the first man and the first woman that God made chose to reject that divine fellowship. They chose rather to go their own way and humanity has been following in the footsteps of, of Father Adam ever since. But God did not reject humanity entirely and he did not forsake his original desire to create a people for himself. And so what God really did is he began a new work. A new creation, if you will, in which even more of his divine attributes would be put on display. And so you can learn a little bit about God through what he made, the creation. It declares the glory of God, the Bible says. But we are going to learn even more about God through the new creation that he is making. And that new creation, that new work really began when God called a man named Abram. Who was later to be called Abraham. And this man, from this man, God created a people for himself. A nation that was set apart from other nations. He gave them his law. He made a covenant with them. He didn't make a covenant with any other nation. He hasn't since. God doesn't have any covenant with the United States, sorry to say. He made a covenant with them. But throughout their history, kind of like Adam and Eve in the beginning, they failed to keep that covenant they chose to break God's law and go their own way. And so then we fast forward to the prophet Jeremiah. Remember I said there's a quotation in our text in Hebrews from the prophet Jeremiah. At a time when the clouds of judgment were gathering over Jerusalem, God promised through the prophet Jeremiah that the days were coming when he would make a new covenant. This covenant would be very different from the covenant God made with Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. And the writer of Hebrews quotes this prophecy of Jeremiah and argues that through Jesus Christ, this prophecy has been fulfilled. And a new covenant has indeed been made. And that means the old one, the old covenant of law has officially become obsolete. Now that's what we're going to talk about in a nutshell. Now the Jeremiah quote in our text comes in the middle of a brilliant argument that this new covenant is better than the old one. Jesus himself is the basis of a new and better covenant. In Hebrews 7 verse 22 in the previous chapter, the writer says this. That this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The English word guarantor is a, it's a financial term. It's a surety, a bond, or a promise by one party to assume responsibility for the obligations of another party. In other words, Jesus has assumed full responsibility for this new covenant. It's based on him and on who he is and on what he does and has done. The new covenant is not based on you or me or our performance or our work. It's based on Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews makes this three-part argument that I'm going to summarize very quickly before we get into the heart of our subject. He says it's a better covenant because, number one, Jesus is a better priest. Number two, it's founded, this covenant, this new covenant, is founded on better promises, and it's better because Jesus offered a better sacrifice. Let me, look, let me just hit on these, these three things very quickly. First of all, Jesus is a better priest. The obligations of the new covenant are undertaken and underwritten by the priesthood of Jesus. That's the whole seventh chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews. 
Jesus has entered into the true sanctuary, heaven itself, to intercede for his people. See, the, the old priests under the law, they ministered down here on earth in an earthly tabernacle that was just a copy of what was in heaven. But Jesus went to heaven the true sanctuary, into the very presence of God. And Jesus is a permanent priest. The priests under the old covenant died. Jesus has an indestructible life. He's been raised from the dead. He's never going to die again. He's never going to be replaced. You, don't, you can't replace Jesus. He's got a permanent priesthood. And that means that Jesus takes us further than the priests under the old covenant could take us. Jesus can take you all the way to God. If you let him, he'll take you all the way to heaven and to eternal life. Secondly, the covenant Jesus now mediates is based on better promises. In chapter 8, verse 6, the writer says this, As it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. And I believe that that is referring to the promise made to Abraham and then to Isaac, and then it was repeated to Jacob. In other words, the new covenant is actually the original covenant. That God spoke this promise to Abraham way back in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, through you and your seed, I'm going to bless the whole world. The covenant of law through Moses at Mount Sinai, That was added later to the original promise God made to Abraham. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Thirdly, it was the death of Christ, his sacrifice, that finally made it possible for the promises that God made back there to Abraham to be fully realized by us today who believe in Jesus. Roman, or excuse me, Hebrews 9:15. Therefore, he, that's Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Sin had to be taken away completely from the presence of God so that the promise could be fulfilled. Now, the Old Covenant never did that. The law never took away sin. But since he died to take away our sin, Jesus can now mediate all the blessings of the New Covenant that were originally promised to Abraham. Remember the promise was, I'll bless the world? You can have that blessing tonight through faith in Jesus Christ Because he has died and taken sin out of the way. And there's nothing that keeps God from blessing us. Nothing at all. So it's a better covenant. New covenant's a better covenant than the old because Jesus is a permanent priest. The power of an indestructible life. It's founded on better promises, and Jesus has offered a better sacrifice. Now, now why, is the, why is the writer of Hebrews talking about these things? Well, it's because these people to whom he is writing, they were Jewish Christians, and they were being tempted to, to, to leave Jesus and the gospel and go back to observing the law. And that would be a huge mistake. Why? Because God has made a new covenant. God has done something new. He's moved on. You can't go back to the old. And those who do so cannot be retrieved again. Now this is, this is a somewhat of a controversial passage, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, says that people who fall away cannot be renewed again to repentance. Now, I know people get in theological arguments about, well, can you fall away and can you, can you lose your salvation and everything else? Listen, if you know Jesus and you reject Jesus and you go to something else, it doesn't matter what it is, even if it's the law, there's nothing else that can save you. There's only one Savior. There's only one gospel. If you hear that gospel and you reject it, there isn't anything else we can can bring to you to save you. 
So we'll let people argue about, you know, can you fall away and can a per Christian lose his salvation? Let's put that argument aside and let's just remember there's, there's only one Savior. And you reject Him, there isn't anything else to bring you to God. The law's not going to do it. No, Buddha's not going to do it. Muhammad's not going to do it. Sitting around and meditating on your navel is not going to do it. And here's how the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews reasons. He says, if those who disobeyed the law were severely punished, what do you think God's going to do to someone who refuses to listen to his son? You can read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and Hebrews 12, 25. Serious stuff. Don't refuse him who's speaking from heaven. Well, let's get down to business. Why did God have to make a new covenant? My text is that God made a new covenant, but why, why did he have to do this? Was there something wrong with the law? The, the people broke the law, they broke the covenant, they failed. Was God surprised by that fail, failure? Did God say, oh no, they broke the covenant. I hadn't thought of that. I guess we better go to plan B. Well, we know that's ridiculous. God is never surprised. In fact, in this case, man's failure was part of the divine plan. God didn't cause Israel to fail and break the covenant, but he knew that they would. God made a covenant he knew would be broken. Why? Because this, that old covenant of law that God made through Moses at Mount Sinai, that was sort of like a controlled experiment. It was a controlled experiment to prove, not to God, he already knew, but to prove to all of us the reality of human frailty and human failure. That's what the law was to do. Now, human failure does not negate the divine purpose. God, God's purpose is not based on whether or not we can perform. If it, if it were, then God's purpose would have fallen flat. Israel broke the covenant, but that did not annul the promise God had made previously to Abraham. And so what this means, and this is what the Bible is teaching all the way through, is that God has never changed his plan once. God has never changed his plan. God doesn't do like, 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 the, like we say, change horses in midstream. God doesn't do that. He has never switched his plan. He has been perfectly consistent. The new covenant is not plan B. And the failure of man does not derail the purpose of God. God doesn't make mistakes. And God's word and God's law is without flaw. The covenant did not fail because there was something wrong with the law. The law, as Paul said in Romans, is holy, righteous, and good. In fact, the law of God is an expression of his nature. But our response to God's law is an expression of human nature. And that was the problem. The problem with the covenant was not the law. The problem was the hearts of the people. And we're not, this is not to pick on the Jewish people. Because their failure was a picture of our failure. Just like Adam's sin is something that all of us have done too. So we're not blaming Adam for our problems. We're not blaming Israel we're seeing ourselves here like looking in a mirror. God is showing us something about ourselves through these examples in the scripture. The problem, it says he found fault with the people. Isn't that what the text said? He found fault, not with his law, not with the covenant itself, but with the people. That was the problem. The people didn't keep the covenant. And therefore... Excuse me, they did not keep the law, and therefore they did not keep the obligations of the covenant. Now, a covenant, if you don't know what a covenant is, is an agreement between two parties. They each agree to do certain things. This is a normal kind of covenant. As long as both parties hold up their end of the deal, then the covenant is good. But if one or both parties fail to keep their agreement, then the covenant is broken, and there are usually penalties written into covenants for breaking the agreement. Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 29, pronounced a curse on anyone who failed to keep that covenant. 
that God made with Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. Now maybe, maybe the problem was is that the commandments were just too hard. Maybe that was the problem. Maybe God was just being a little too demanding. Maybe he was just being a little too harsh. He was just being unreasonable with the people. Just giving them too much. There are many people today who think this way about God. God is some kind of ogre. God is some kind of cosmic killjoy. God is some kind of ruthless tyrant who's just waiting for someone to have a good time so that he can zap them like a bug. Many people think religion is all about rules. And God is just restricting us and making life more difficult for us. Just trying to make us miserable. But you see the trouble with the law was not that they couldn't obey it. The trouble was with the fact that they didn't obey it. They had two paths set before them. Life and death. That's what Moses told them in Deuteronomy. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And they chose to break God's law. Now this shows us what happens when human beings are given a choice. Adam and Eve are in the same condition. You give man a choice. It's a clear choice. Don't eat from that tree. That was only one commandment. God gave, God gave Israel ten and a lot of others too, but the ten was like a summation of everything else. What does man do when he has a choice? Well, he inevitably, he inevitably makes the wrong choice, just as Adam and Eve did. You see, free will only results in death. People say, well, do we have free will? Well, your, your free will will take you to hell. That's where it will take you. We know that because of the people of Israel. They had the law, they chose to break it. And we've done the same thing. We've done the exact same thing. We've broken God's law. Now, they had good intentions to obey the law of God. The people said to Moses at Sinai, Go near and hear all that the Lord will say, and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to, to you, and we will hear it and do it. That sounds pretty good. That sounds like they had good intentions. And then the Lord said this to Moses. This is in Deuteronomy 5, 27 to 29. I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always. To fear me and to keep all my commandments that it might go well with them and their descendants forever so much for all good intentions. Good intentions don't really count. You have to follow through on them. Amen. And that's what Israel didn't do. See, we say we're going to do our best. We think that we're doing our best to obey God, but we're not. We're not. Nobody does their best. And Israel didn't do their best, and it did not go well with them or their descendants. Many generations later, Jeremiah charged Israel with breaking the covenant. Jeremiah 11, 6 to 8. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently even to this day, saying, Obey my voice, yet they did not obey. Or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did not. And neither did, neither did I, and neither did you. Why was Israel, why did Israel not keep the words of the covenant, which was the law, by the way? The words of the covenant was the, the law. Moses knew why the people would not be faithful. Deuteronomy 29, verse 4. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand, or eyes to see, or ears to hear. Even after receiving all the blessings of God, the people still turned away in their hearts. They did not love God, which, by the way, was the first and most important commandment of the law. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. So why didn't God give them a heart to love him? It's because he was demonstrating through them the truth about human nature. There is something wrong with us. There's something wrong with the heart or nature of man that law cannot change. Amen. 
All of us have broken God's law like Israel. Again, we're not just, we're not being anti-Semitic here and picking on the Jewish people. We're just like them, at least apart from the grace of God. And that's what I'm going to develop here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not just Israel. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The law was given to teach us about sin. The law stirs up sin in our hearts, making it come out of its dark hiding places. In Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan compares the law to a person with a broom sweeping a dusty room. The law doesn't clean our dirty hearts. It just stirs up the mess that's already there. Paul said, I wouldn't have known what sin was except through the law. Romans 7. You see, the law was external. God knew that he would have to make another covenant, one that would address the internal condition of the heart. Because as Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 7, 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Now, when it comes to making a covenant, this new covenant, it says God is going to make this covenant. This is not some kind of negotiation. The covenant is not something that we get together, that we got together and had a discussion with God. You know, sit down at the bargaining table. Let's make a deal, God. Now, some people try to do that. I'll make a deal with you, God. If I go to church every Sunday, you give me the new job or whatever. I know people try to do that, but that's not what this covenant was about. It was not negotiated it's important to notice that Abraham did not go to God and ask for a covenant. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. There's no evidence that Abraham even knew God prior to that calling. And the people of Israel did not ask for a covenant. God brought them to Mount Sinai. Scared them half to death when God came down on the mountain. They didn't even want to be there after a while. This is not a, a deal that's negotiated between God and man. The initiative is always with God. Not with man. What does that mean? It means that God is a gracious God. This is a demonstration of God's grace. You see, he owes us nothing. And we owe him everything. He came after us. We weren't, there's no one who seeks after God. All have turned away. This new covenant that God makes will not be the same kind of covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai. There's a significant difference between the old covenant of law and this new covenant. Now remember that this new covenant is actually a fulfillment of the promise God made to Abraham and then to Isaac and Jacob. The covenant at Mount Sinai was a separate covenant and was a different kind of arrangement. The Abrahamic covenant, the covenant God made with Abraham, remained in force... Even after God gave the law at Sinai. Now this might get a little technical, but please stay with me. The promise that God made to Abraham was unilateral. One-sided. That is, God simply made a promise to Abraham. There was nothing for Abraham to do except believe the promise. And Abraham did believe God, and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6, one of the most important verses in the Bible, by the way. Later, God gave Abraham the sign of the covenant, which was circumcision. But Abraham already had the covenant, he already had the promise, he had already believed it, he had already been justified before he was circumcised. Now, this is an important point that Paul makes in his letter to the Galatians, actually in Romans and also in Galatians. The Galatians did not understand these things. They were trying to be justified by the law by being circumcised. And so Paul made this distinction between the promise God gave to Abraham and the law he gave to Israel through Moses. This is Galatians 3, verse 17 through 20. This is what I mean, Paul says, the law which came 430 years afterward, after what? the promise to Abraham, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? 
Why'd God give the law then? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring, the seed, should come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. What is he talking about? God is one. The law was not unilateral. Moses was a mediator. Because there were two parties involved in the covenant, God and Israel. That's the traditional model for a covenant. Israel had to obey to keep their end of the covenant. The blessings were conditional. But the covenant God made with Abraham was not a traditional covenant. It was simply a promise. And that is why there was no mediator between God and Abraham. God spoke, God is one. God spoke directly to Abraham about what God was going to do. The Abrahamic blessing was not conditional. God himself would bring the blessing. Abraham simply had to agree with God or believe the promise to seal the deal. Now, if I came to you and told you that next year I would transfer a large sum of money into your account and all you had to do was to receive the money, that's like the promise to Abraham. But if I told you you had to sign a contract with me, agree to work for me for a year in order to receive the money, that's like the covenant at Mount Sinai. Different covenant, different terms and conditions. Now, the new covenant that God made through Christ is not like the covenant he made at Mount Sinai. It is like the covenant he made with Abraham. In fact, it is a fulfillment of that promise, and so really the promise and the new covenant are one and the same. The promise is the seed, the new covenant is the flower that grew up. The law was added to the promise because of the radical problem of human sin... The ministry of the law was to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. That's why there were so many types and shadows. So that the Redeemer would be recognized and his work would be understood. Now was God suddenly just repealing the law? Are the Ten Commandments repealed? Are they themselves now unnecessary? Are, are we to become antinomians who have no standards for righteous living? Antinomian means against the law. Or no law. It seems that some have taken that position in the church today. That righteous living really doesn't matter under grace like it did under the law. So let us sin. So that grace may increase. We need to make two distinctions. First of all, there's a distinction between the law or the commandments and the covenant. The people of Israel entered into the covenant with God... ...when they agreed to obey the commandments. So saying that the covenant is over... ...is not the same thing as saying the commandments are erased. Secondly, there's a difference between moral commandments... ...and ceremonial commandments. The moral commandments are universal, absolute expressions of righteousness... ...and will never pass away... ...according to Jesus himself in Matthew 5, 17 to 19. It was the ceremonial laws, priests, feasts... Sacrifices, washings, food, tabernacle, those have become obsolete because they were types and shadows. So the moral requirements of the law still stand. God did not change and he does not relax his righteous requirements. In fact, the new covenant is actually more demanding than the old because it takes into consideration even the thoughts and motives of the heart. Isn't that what it says? He's going to write his law in our hearts? That was the theme of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, your righteousness has to surpass that of the, the scribes and the Pharisees. What does that mean? They had an external righteousness. Your righteousness has to go inside you, into your heart. You have to actually be righteous, not just look like you're righteous for other men to see. The new covenant is not an easier covenant. That's not what's going on here. It's not that God decided that the law was just too hard for us. And so he came up with something that was a little more laid back. No. There are some people who seem to compare the old covenant of law and the new covenant of grace in this way. Well, law is really hard and we can't do it. But grace is easy. 
We all sin, you know, but we get grace. It's okay. God is gracious. Sin now. Get forgiven later. No big deal. Well, there are multiple problems with that way of thinking. First of all, it makes God soft on sin, as if God's righteousness is something bendable or negotiable, and it isn't. Secondly, it ignores what God promised to do in the new covenant. God does not change. But God would work a change in the hearts of his people. That's the new covenant. That's the promise of the new covenant. And so you can think of the prophecy of Jeremiah as an exposition of the promise of blessing given to Abraham. God promises blessing through Abraham's seed, which is Christ. How exactly will God bless his people in the new covenant that Jesus has established? God made four promises in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, which is quoted in Hebrews 8. He made four promises about the new covenant, all of which come directly from the prophecy of Jeremiah. I'm going to give you these four promises and then I'll be done. First, the new covenant that God promised to make, promised that God would work in the hearts of his people. That's the difference between the covenants. In the old covenant, there was no transformation of the heart. There was forgiveness, but no gift of the Spirit. This new covenant is something that God does in us. It's not something that we do, which was the case under the law, this do and live. God was going to perform spiritual surgery and circumcise the hearts of his people. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, who was an expert in the law, you have to be born again. The law, just having the law is not enough. And by the way, having the law of God written on your heart, putting your mind, that's the same thing as being born of the Spirit. That's what Jesus was talking about in John 3 to Nicodemus. The new covenant then is internal, not external. It is spiritual, not ritual. We worship God in spirit, putting no confidence in the flesh. Amen. The old covenant was a carnal covenant with carnal blessings. This is why we don't baptize infants. I know some do. But we don't do that because we recognize the difference between the old and the new covenant. The old covenant was something you were born into because you were a Jew. The sign of the old covenant was circumcision, which was done in the flesh. But to be a part of the new covenant, you have to be born again. And circumcision is done in the heart, not by man, but by the Spirit of God. God is not impressed by carnal religion. And that's why we're not impressed by it either, frankly. God looks at the heart. The old covenant was written on stone, but the new covenant is going to be written on the heart. The primary blessing or mark of this new covenant is that God is going to turn his people from their wickedness. Amen. That's Acts 3.26. You see, God did not relax his righteous requirements. Instead, he made his people capable of actually being righteous. Romans 8, 4 says that the law is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, today, if you buy a new car, you probably can get one of those built-in GPS systems in your car that knows exactly where you are and can take you anywhere on planet Earth that you want to go. The believer has been given an internal spiritual GPS system that always points us in the way that we should go. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The prophet Ezekiel also prophesied about this new work that God would do in the hearts of his people. In Ezekiel 11, God said, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. And then in Ezekiel 36, he says the same thing in a slightly different way. I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Notice the emphasis is placed on the work of God. I will. And then you will. Anything that we do is simply a response to what God has done in us. The work of God in us is so radical that Paul compared it to being raised from the dead. 
In Ephesians 2, he said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but you've been raised to life. C.S. Lewis said that we were like statues made of cold, hard stone that God has brought to life. And now we can live unto God like real people who can think and serve and love and be loved. The second promise of the new covenant is that the people will love God and be faithful to him. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. Remember that love is the fulfillment of the law. The most important commandment, Jesus says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Israel had always struggled with that throughout their history. But new covenant people do not struggle with loving God. New covenant people, you got to believe me when I say this. New covenant people are basically not wayward. Or inconsistent in their devotion to God. They have thrown down all the idols of the heart. And if that has not taken place in your heart, then you are not a part of the new covenant. That's right. Amen. Amen. When you have a group of people who are basically wayward, yet insist on being religious, that is old covenant religion. And I'm here to tell you it's obsolete. Perhaps you have even heard, we've all heard church people say, we're just like those Israelites. Well, that is an amazing confession. What they are really saying is that they are not members of the new covenant. Now, remember what I said. Apart from the grace of God, we are like the Israelites. But God does a work in us, in our hearts. You know, when we were children, we related to our parents mostly through law. There was a parent-child hierarchy. We had to obey or there were consequences. Children need parents to guide them because they're not grown up yet and they don't understand. Listen, those who are under law are like little children. Under the authority of parents. This is what Paul said in Galatians 3, 24 and 25. Now what parents really want for their children is for them to begin to internalize certain things so that they mature. And become responsible adults. Every parent longs for the day when he or she doesn't have to say, it's time to get up, honey. My dad doesn't have to call me and say, Jason, it's time to get up. I don't call my dad and say, Dad, can I go out and play tonight? Because I've internalized some things. See, What God wants is mature adult children who have actually participated in his divine nature, who understand his ways, and who love him freely without coercion. Eventually, you have to move beyond a law-keeping mentality in your relationship with God and grow up in Christ. That's the kind of people God wants. Thirdly, the new covenant promises that the people will know God. They'll all know me, from the least to the greatest. The people were not intimate with God under the law. The whole system told the people to stay back, lest you be destroyed. The very existence of the tabernacle with that curtain in front of the most holy place declared that there was a separation between God and the people. But in the new covenant, God will teach the people. There is no person in the new covenant who is ignorant of God. There is an intimate knowledge that is actually fellowship, not an academic or intellectual knowledge, but a personal knowledge of God. The new covenant is very personal. It's personal, but it isn't private. It's personal, but it isn't private. This does not mean that we don't have to learn about God from Scripture or that we don't need teachers and pastors to help us, but no one in the new covenant will be ignorant of who the real God is. Nor will they be kept from having intimate spiritual fellowship with the Father. Paul said it this way, that we cry out, Abba, Father. Intimacy. There's no special class of people in the new covenant who know God, while the others remain ignorant and alienated. There's no clergy laity. We're all priests of God and have access to God. Fourthly and finally, the new covenant promises that God will forgive the sins of his people. Now, this is a once-for-all-time remedy for sin. It's not the constant reminder of sins that accompanied the bringing of sacrifices like it was done under the law. The sacrifices under the law were actually a reminder of the people's sins, 
but the blood of Christ cleanses the conscience of the worshiper. The conscience is your knowledge of sin, so that now you have the knowledge of forgiveness. The law was only a shadow that provisionally forgave sin. The repetition of animal sacrifices meant that these did not actually take away sin. If they did, they wouldn't have had to be repeated over and over again. But the blood of Christ takes away our sin, giving us confidence to approach God, something they did not have under the law. And that's why when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the way to God has been opened. The only way to come to God is through Christ. You can't come through law or any other way. The law is no longer in force as a covenant or a way of coming to God. And the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, as prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24, ended the sacrifices and the priesthood. Now we believe the Jews have a future with God. But it is not through the law. And anyone trying to reinstitute the law or the sacrifices or the feast days or the Sabbath days or any of those other things have ignored the new covenant that God has made. They're going backwards and God does not allow that. If people today whether it be church people or otherwise, do not give some kind of evidence that their hearts have been changed, that they love God, that they know God, and that they have confidence that their sins have been forgiven. Those people may be religious, they may even be moral to some degree, but they are not members of the new covenant. Those are the signs. Those four things I just gave you, those promises are signs of the new covenant. If those aren't evident to some degree in your life, you're just a religious person. And that's obsolete. God's moved on from that. The new covenant is not found in the pages of scripture. The the second half of your Bible is not the new covenant. It's in here. Not in, not in, not Not ink on paper, it's written on our hearts. The new covenant is not a creed, it's not a denomination, it's not an institution, it's not a church group or a theological position. You can have all those things and not have the new covenant and the people will just be religious and they will be rejected by God. But the same God who created the world And everything in it is in the process of creating a people. Actually, he's creating a bride. Marriage is a covenant. He's creating a people, a bride, who can intimately share his life forever. Covenant is all about intimacy and the merging of two hearts into one. And so God's greatest work, God's greatest work surpassing even the glory of the brightest stars in the universe is his creation of a people to whom he could reveal his infinite love and who could freely choose to love him in return forever and ever. And that is the new covenant 